Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. My name is Hannah Jacobs. I'm the Digital Humanities Specialist for the Wired Lab for Digital Art History and Visual Culture at Duke. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional land of the Eno people, later subsumed under the Saponi tribe. And I'd like to thank you for joining us to hear Danica Savonic on the feminist genealogies of digital pedagogy. Danica is assistant professor of English at the State University of New York College at Cortland. Her teaching and research analyze the intersections among 20th century and contemporary US literature and culture, feminist aesthetics and poetics, critical race, gender and sexuality studies, and student-centered pedagogy. She received her PhD in English and a certificate in American Studies from the City University of New York Graduate Center, where she was a Futures Initiative Fellow and a Haystack Scholar, and a recipient of a Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowship, a Woodrow Wilson uh, Dissertation Fellowship in Women's Studies, and the AACNU K. Patricia Cross Future Leaders Award. Welcome, Danica. Thank you, Hannah, um, for that introduction. Um, thank you also to Victoria and to Amanda um, and to Jennifer for arranging my visit today. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you, um, to share some of my research and some of my teaching related to what I'm calling um, the feminist genealogies of digital pedagogy. And so this talk has two parts, and it runs for about half an hour, a little bit less, um, which I'm hoping will leave plenty of time for conversation and discussion afterwards. Much of contemporary digital pedagogy revolves around project-based learning. The idea that working together on projects is the best way to develop digital research methods and learn about the ethics and politics of different technologies. A quick glance at the online collection, Keywords for Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities, provides some useful examples of this. Each keyword entry contains pedagogical artifacts related to key digital humanities terms, such as blogging, multimodal, and praxis. Many of these artifacts are collaborative, public digital projects produced in humanities courses. They include such examples as podcasts on student research topics, websites on science fiction and artificial intelligence, computer games designed to teach empathy, Tumblr archives, YouTube videos on Latina life stories, timelines on LGBT representation in literature, and projects developed to serve local community and nonprofit organizations. There's even an entry dedicated to project management, recognizing this as a key humanistic skill. And I was thinking about this in the context of the um, versatile humanities PhD panel earlier today, um, and this connection um, to thinking about project management management as um, a skill. And so one of the things that we might talk about um, in the Q&A is the ways that um, pedagogical change at the undergraduate level might be connected to some of the structural changes at the level of the PhD as well. And so while some of these projects um, take the form of prototypes, a lot of them aim to do real work in the world. And so today I'm gonna focus on that aspect of um, project-based learning, the fact that it's oftentimes done and um, made available in public. So within the field of writing studies, scholars are increasingly arguing that one of the best ways to teach is not by assigning a traditional final paper that will be read solely by the instructor, but to assign projects that ask students to write for audiences beyond the classroom, for instance, through blogs or editorials um, or articles. In a 2007 longitudinal study, Andrea Lunsford and a team of researchers analyzed the writing practices of Stanford students over the course of five years and found that this generation of students values writing that makes something happen. Quote, they write to shake the world. And in her 2009 NCTE report, Kathleen Blake Yancey called for public writing as a crucial component of a composition pedagogy that prepares students to write in the 21st century. This call for public learning has echoed throughout the digital humanities community as well by scholars like Mark Sample, Kathy Ann Davidson, Alan Liu, Tanya Clement, Amy Earhart, and Tanisha Taylor. Considered together, their work suggests that collaborative public projects encourage peer learning, amplify engagement, and in Clement's words, increase students' sense of creative control and desire to participate in society. And so in this talk today, I'm going to argue that this praxis of public and project-based learning is not merely a response to the internet, but has also been crucial to genealogies of feminist and anti-racist pedagogy, and that attending to this genealogy can help us think in more nuanced terms about the transformative impact that collaborative, multimodal, and public projects can have in our present. 
So in part one of this talk, I'm going to do a little bit of um, time traveling back to the 1960s and 70s to revisit some of the ways that feminist and anti-racist authors and activists were reimagining humanity's pedagogy in light of the social movements and politics of that era. And then in part two, I'll return us to the present to discuss how this historical moment has shaped my approach to digital pedagogy and to open up a larger conversation about that. So part one, feminist genealogies of public project-based pedagogy. My thinking about digital humanities is informed by my research on feminist pedagogy. Feminist pedagogy is an approach to learning that challenges social hierarchies, focuses on student empowerment, and addresses the uneven distribution of resources along embodied axes of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability. My current book project, Insurgent Knowledge, analyzes the reciprocal relations between teaching and writing in the work of four famous feminist and anti-racist authors, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, Toni Cade Bambara, and Adrienne Rich. In 1968, at the height of the women's movement, the civil rights movement, black power, and protests against the Vietnam War, and the same year that Paulo Freire was writing his foundational Pedagogy of the Oppressed, these authors were teaching down the hall from one another at Harlem City College in the nation's first state-mandated educational opportunity program and during open admissions. And so while these figures are most often studied for their literature, I position them as theorists of feminist pedagogy who drew on their poetic sensibilities to develop student-centered, collaborative, and consciousness-raising pedagogies that transform their classrooms into sites of social change. At the same time, I'm interested in how the experience of teaching fundamentally altered their writing and with it the course of 20th century American literature. 20th century America was marked by a massive expansion of higher education under the auspices of the GI Bill, the National Higher Education Act, and government support for educational opportunity, affirmative action, and open admissions programs. Together, these initiatives made higher education more available to women, working class and first generation students, and students of color. Nationwide, this unprecedented expansion resulted in a much more economically, racially, and gender diverse student population, and complex encounters between these new students and traditional pedagogy, curricula, institutions, and faculty. At the City University of New York, open admissions was met with vehement opposition and the widespread racist belief that these students would lower academic standards and decrease the quality of education. Mainstream media and journalism pathologized these students as, quote, deprived, disadvantaged, former or current drug addicts, unwed mothers, ghetto residents, fatherless, untrained monkeys, and lions caged in a zoo. And much of this dehumanizing rhetoric came from within the CUNY professoriate, especially within the humanities. Open admissions, according to the chair of the City College English Department, is how you kill a college. So at a time when uh, many faculty were accusing these democratizing initiatives of killing higher education, a number of eminent writers were lining up at the door to teach in these very same classrooms. Jordan, Lord, Bambara, and Rich, along with scholars of African-American literature Addison Gale and Barbara Christian, and composition theorist Mina Shaughnessy, understood that many of these students came from underfunded schools that were left out of the city's progressive era education reforms. They understood that students' unpreparedness was the product of racist institutions, discrimination, underemployment, and poverty, and not individual deficiencies. They saw open admissions as a tremendous opportunity to reinvent American higher education, making it more relevant to an increasingly diverse student body and more responsive to the democratic politics of the time. Together, they formed an insurrectionary pedagogical milieu committed to the success of working class students, first generation students, and students of color. In a moment when conservative politicians like Ronald Reagan were calling art education an intellectual luxury, these teacher poets were part of a groundswell movement of educators who understood the humanities as crucial for navigating and transforming the world. Best articulated by Audre Lorde, the study of language and literature in community college, open admissions and remedial writing classrooms, in community centers, in weekend workshops, and around the kitchen table was never understood as a luxury, but as a way of improving, quote, the quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives, a necessary undertaking for those rendered vulnerable by the social order. As educators, these authors use literary texts as learning devices to help students better understand culture as a terrain of power struggle and a key site for intervening in the status quo. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus on the public and project-based pedagogies of June Jordan and Tony Cade Bambara, 
whose work encourages us to think about humanity's course design by emphasizing the material conditions in which language and information circulate. Their feminist and anti-racist pedagogies offer frameworks for thinking about di digital pedagogy, not merely as a response to the internet, but as a continuation of long ongoing efforts to teach social justice. And so for those who may be unfamiliar with their work, uh, Jordan is best known as a poet, journalist, and essayist whose work critiqued both longstanding conditions of racism, sexism, homophobia, and imperialism, and their manifestations in daily life. Her writing addresses issues like the race riots of the 1960s, police brutality against African Americans, unequal housing conditions and widespread poverty in New York City, rape culture, and racial profiling. Bambara is best known as a fiction writer whose explosive polyvocal and postmodern writing centered the concerns of African American communities and women in particular, celebrating their long cultural traditions of using storytelling to survive and flourish. As educators and pedagogical theorists, Bambara and Jordan both organized their classrooms around the project of publishing student writing. To better understand this, it's useful to revisit four anthologies edited um, by Jordan and Bambara. Uh, the Black Woman, The Voice of the Children, Soul Script, and Tales and Stories for Black Folks. While these texts may be familiar to scholars of African American literature and women's gender and sexuality studies, scholars rarely consider the fact that all of these included student writing. In fact, much of the writing in these collections emerged from the courses these authors taught at Tougaloo College, City College, Rutgers Livingston, and in less formal spaces like weekend writing workshops. Instead of having students submit writing solely to be read by the instructor, they organized their courses around the production of texts that could circulate in the world beyond the classroom. I read these published collections and their inclusion of student writing as the enactment of a social justice pedagogy that addressed urgent social issues. For example, The Voice of the Children is a poetry collection authored entirely by students in Jordan's weekend writing workshops and published in 1970. In this collection, the young authors, ranging in age from 12 to 14, address the offensive and inaccurate stereotypes of illiterate ghetto children of color that were circulating in mainstream media in the late 1960s. Journalists regularly describe these children as, quote, silent creatures who didn't know the names of things, didn't know that things had names, didn't even know their own names. And yet, in just the first few pages of The Voice of the Children, the young authors respond to prompts such as, what would you do if you were president, with trenchant critiques of racist stereotypes, settler colonialism, US imperialism, and patriarchy, made all the more powerful when we consider that their average age was 13. In the opening prose poem, 14-year-old Vanessa Howard theorizes the power of stereotypes to reduce the complexity of individuals. She writes, Nine out of 10 times when a person hears the word ghetto, they think of black people, first of all. Ghetto has become a definition meaning black, garbage, slum areas. To me, the word ghetto is just as bad as cursing. I think they put all black people in a box marked ghetto, which leaves them having no identity. They should let black people be seen for themselves, not as one reflection of all. By teaching her students that they were authors with important things to say, Jordan directly challenged the ways mainstream media pathologized working class students of color as deprived, disadvantaged, unruly bodies in need of discipline. And so with this project, one of the things that I'm trying to do in looking at these collections and other um, archival documents is to excavate the classroom conditions and the pedagogical decisions that factored into their construction. In contrast to the top-down construction of traditional anthologies, um, we might think of like the Norton, uh, which are typically produced for but not by students in the classroom, Jordan and Bambara acted on a conviction that authorship, the power to affect people through language, is widely distributed despite cultural institutions that privilege the voices of a narrow white male elite. The authors they worked with were low income, women with families to support, people of color, and often students, some as young as nine, and the editorial labor that went into these collections ranged from convincing publishers that these authors had something important to say to convincing the authors themselves. As educator editors, they put in countless uncompensated hours corresponding with publishers, negotiating contracts, and organizing publicity events. They did so because they understood the multifaceted impact that these anthologies could make in people's lives. 
These publications help students understand the power of their voices and share survival strategies across the partitioning walls of classrooms and institutions. They address gaps in the literary and cultural record, and they call out to collectives of readers who had previously been ignored by publishers. Publishing student writing would become a central component of Jordan's pedagogy for years to come, most notably in her poetry for the People program at UC Berkeley in the 1990s, where she trained hundreds of students to write, publish, and perform their poetry, and to become educators who would go out into community centers, homeless shelters, K-12 schools, and churches to teach others to write and publish their poetry. Taking advantage of campus resources, Jordan insisted in students' involvement, not just in the co-creation of their classroom, but in the publication process, editing, proofing, binding, budgeting, distribution, and marketing. Reflecting on a course that concluded with a collaboratively authored anthology, Jordan notes that the class was producing its own literature, a literature reflecting the ideas and dreams and memories of the actual young Americans at work. These anthologies were part of a grassroots movement for pedagogical, cultural, and social change that emerged not from top-down decisions by school boards, but led by writers and teachers embedded in city classrooms who witnessed the pernicious gaps among existing curricula, the abundance of black poetry, and the experiences of students' lives. In doing so, their pedagogy drew on a long history of black self-publishing, which was central to both the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement. And it was from these experiences of trying to publish their and their students' writing that Kitchen Table, Woman of Color Press was eventually born. But these anthologies are just some examples of how Jordan and Bambara organized their courses around the production of collaborative public projects that could make an impact in the world beyond the classroom. In Bambara's courses on subjects like colonialism, neocolonialism, and liberation, or the text as a right of recovery, rather than dictating the forms their final project should take, she often asked students to find or invent a form that would best tell the story of their learning and share these lessons with a public audience beyond the classroom. Do not write term papers for me, Bambara told students. Make sure they are useful for somebody else as well. Suggesting forms such as um, a collaborative annotated bibliography, a performance, sh a short story for radio or TV, a magazine, puppet theater, a street theater performance, a slideshow, or a picture book. The one requirement was that it can be shared with others. Some examples of Jordan's collaborative projects include a Wrath Rally and letter writing campaign against poverty in Biafra, organized by students in her Upward Bound class, dramatic radio productions on children's welfare and racial justice in South Central Los Angeles, and a revolutionary blueprint, which is pictured here, a collection of reading lists, syllabi, poetry, and activities that turn the lessons of her Poetry for the People program into a kind of how-to guide for others who are interested in democratizing poetry. Reflecting on what happens when students are asked not necessarily to write about literature, but to use what they learn about language through literature to move people to action, Jordan notes that students writing leaped into an eloquent fluency that had never even been hinted in their earlier work. Through these assignments, these teacher poets taught students that their voices, stories, and actions mattered for social change. In short, that each student has much to teach America. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is the ways that during this moment, um, a lot of the defenders of the traditional humanities um, who looked down on the new students and were accusing them of diluting the quality of education were also really looking down on the fact that these new students, their preferred means of accessing information and culture were often through radio and through television. And so when you look at the, the language that they use to pathologize these students, it's really, um, it's bound up with their looking down on the new media and their, their preferred um, means of accessing culture um, and information. And so it seems significant to me then that Bambara and Jordan, as part of this kind of activist pedagogy, would be deliberately trying to incorporate the, um, the forms of media that most interested um, their students and that interested them as well. As educators, we are accustomed to thinking about how our classes can be useful to students, but Jordan and Bambara urge us to consider how classrooms can also become useful to the world beyond their walls. They believe that everyone has something to contribute to the production of a more just, equitable, and pleasurable future, and that classrooms were one site for discovering what that might entail. Through these assignments, Jordan and Bambara taught students not only how to analyze language, but also to interrogate the ways that dominant media, culture, and curricula privilege certain voices over others, and they challenged students to use what they were learning to address these conditions.
Especially in their work with working class students of color, this often took the form of intervening in dominant narratives and getting better poems and better books into the hands of readers who needed them. Considered together, their work demonstrates how publishing student writing is not merely a response to the digital era, but has long been a component of feminist pedagogy, which encourages students to use what they are learning to make a positive impact on the world. At the same time, their examples suggest that we need to continue analyzing the material structures, platforms, and institutions in and through which language circulates in order to improve these to better support justice and equity. And so it's this line of inquiry um, that shapes my contemporary engagement with digital humanities and with digital pedagogy. Which brings me to part two, contemporary approaches to digital pedagogy. In constituting this genealogy, I want to acknowledge the many scholars before me who have traced different aspects of contemporary digital humanities work to feminist and anti-racist activism, especially Lisa Nakamura, Rupika Rizam, and the four scholars who initiated hashtag TransformDH, Moya Bailey, Anne Kong Huen, Alexis Lothian, and Amanda Phillips, all of whom have helped me think, criti helped me think critically about the activist potential of digital pedagogy. So returning to the present, I'd like to discuss how contemporary approaches to digital humanities can build on this kind of collaborative, multimodal, and public pedagogy, and in many ways are. My goal is not um, necessarily to say that we should do exactly what Jordan and Bambara did, although I've occasionally had fun trying. Um, rather, their work offers us ways of thinking about how our own classrooms can address social issues in ways that engage contemporary configurations of knowledge and power and the material platforms like the internet through which culture and ideas circulate. So based on this research, I have reorganized my courses around the production of digital final projects, all of which challenge students to take what they learn and share it with the public audience. These projects have taken at least five different formats um, presented here. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, focus on numbers two through four. So the five different formats that these digital final projects often take are number one, writing for the college community. Number two, authoring public blogs for an open platform like the academic network haystack.org. Number three, co-authoring submissions to a peer-reviewed publication. Number four, creating open-ended projects that challenge students to make their learning useful for an audience beyond the classroom. And number five, co-authoring a digital resource for other students, readers, writers, and educators. So the first one, authoring public blogs for an open platform like the academic network haystack.org. One assignment I've developed based on this research is having students author or co-author blogs for Haystack.org, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with since it originated here at Duke. Haystack is a nonprofit academic social network, blogging platform, and interdisciplinary community that connects student writers to 16,000 network members, quote, and this is from their description, humanists, artists, social scientists, scientists, and technologists committed to changing the way we teach and learn. Unlike many other free digital platforms, Haystack has promised to never share users' data with third parties, which recently earned it the moniker, the Ethical Social Network. Haystack is a crucial platform for exchanging ideas and conversing beyond the silos of our classrooms, disciplines, and institutions. For many of the courses I've taught, the final project is for students to identify a research topic that they want to learn more about and present their findings as a public, public blog post on Haystack. They have written blogs on Black Lives Matter, student activism, gender, and the history of public education, with titles like The U.S. Has Plenty to Learn About Learning. Similar to the assignments um, leading up to a traditional research paper, students develop a research question, perform background research, and go through several stages of outlining, drafting, and revision. We also read examples posted to Haystack and discuss blogs as a genre, addressing questions such as... What do we know about the Haystack community? So we analyze the About page. How is information organized on the site? What are the conventions of the platform? What works well? How are, blogs, how are blog posts structured? How is media incorporated? How are citations attributed, etc.? I teach with Haystack for two reasons. First, because it connects my students to a community of readers and writers, allowing them to gain experience writing for an audience beyond their professors and classmates. And this also seemed like another possible point of connection to the panel earlier on the versatile humanities PhD. Uh, students learn to tailor their writing for a specific audience by reading debates and discussions, carefully planning their point of entry, and exploring the creative possibilities of different genres, what writing studies scholars call kairos. 
Writing for Haystack helps students understand that they are critical participants in larger ongoing conversations, that their voices and stories matter, and that learning offers an opportunity to contribute to the public and social good. But we also have to be careful in encouraging students to join these conversations, careful because they are capable but still learning, because public writing always entails the risk of exposure, because students have complicated lives that may require the cover of confidentiality, and because the digital leaves traces everywhere. This leads me to the second reason I incorporate Haystack, because it allows me to teach digital literacy. Whether the subject of my course is American literature or feminist theory, teaching with Haystack allows us to have conversations about digital identity, privacy, and security. Each semester, we spend a thrilling course reading Haystack's privacy policy and legal agreement so we can discuss the potential risks and rewards of public writing. We discuss how their research can become genuinely useful to others, but also how their writing will be attached to their names and appear in search results for years to come, including those of their potential employers, internet trolls, and immigration officials. My undergraduates publish in the group Scholarly Voices, created by Stephen L. Berg, to showcase undergraduate work within the broader network. I always offer students the option not to publish if they think it will jeopardize their safety in any way, and I'm continually impressed with the creative methods students invent to mitigate these risks, such as publishing with a pseudonym or omitting their names altogether. This past semester, when I asked students why they performed exponentially better on this assignment than on any of their others, their response was unanimous, because they knew other people were going to be reading it. This brings me to the second one. Um, co-authoring submissions for a peer-reviewed publication. Another way I've used publishing to facilitate feminist pedagogy is by organizing my courses around the project of co-authoring submissions to a scholarly peer-reviewed journal. I teach um, an introductory writing course on the purpose of education, which immerses students in contemporary debates related to teaching and learning methods, assessment, unequal school funding, and technology in classrooms. And so while there are many really exciting conversations um, about the purpose of education in today's society, so rarely are the voices of actual students included in these discussions, even though they are the ones who are most affected by them. This is in part because academic hierarchies dictate that students have little, if anything, to contribute to knowledge production. And so my fall 2016 composition course at Queens College took up this issue by preparing students uh, to co-author articles on these subjects for the peer-reviewed open access journal, Hybrid Pedagogy. So students were told at the beginning of the course that they would be reading, writing, and learning all semester in preparation to submit articles to a scholarly peer-reviewed open access journal. At the same time, they learned what a scholarly peer-reviewed open access journal is. Students chose topics they wanted to learn more about, developed original research questions, authored annotated bibliographies, and tirelessly revised their writing, knowing it would eventually be published online for others to read. The majority of my first year writing students received a revise and resubmit from the journal's editors. And if this is something you're interested in, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more in the Q&A about kind of how um, I collaborated with the editor of the journal to uh, arrive at a timeline that would work um, within the constraints of an academic semester. Um, and so the majority of the students received a revise and resubmit. And we followed um, the, uh, Cheryl E. Ball um, has a great um, article on editorial pedagogy. And in that article, she suggests that um, a revise and resubmit in an undergraduate course should be the equivalent of like an A grade. And so we followed her recommendation. Um, given the time constraints of an academic semester, many, uh, many groups of students used the feedback that they received from the journal's editors to publish their writing instead on Haystack rather, uh, rather than continuing with the journal's editorial feedback loop which would have extended far beyond the semester. However, one particularly intrepid group of students continued revising their article for months after our semester ended, responding to the queries posed by the journal's editors and copy editors, and their article, The Ultimate Life Experience, Preparing Students for the World Beyond the Classroom, was published in August 2017, about a full year after we had initially started the assignment. Um, which brings me then to number three. And this is the last example I'll talk about. Creating an open uh, open-ended projects that challenge students to make their learning useful for an audience beyond our classroom. Um, so this is the final example I'll share, um, and it's an open-ended assignment in which I followed Bambara's lead in challenging students to find or invent a form that would best tell the story of something they had learned throughout the semester and make it useful for an audience beyond our classroom. 
In my spring 2017 course on the arts of dissent at Queens College, I suggested how students might use what they learned in our discussions of literature and politics to create a website, timeline, or lesson plan. I also introduced several platforms that they might choose to use for this project, including Haystack and WordPress.org. For this project, one group of students traveled to the Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, a museum and preserved 19th century African American community, to develop a lesson plan and assignment that would use the center's resources and Langston Hughes's poem, Let America Be America Again, to teach high school students about racism. This pair chose to publish their lesson plans on Haystack in hopes of reaching an audience of educators. That semester, we read Claudia Rankine's Citizen, an American Lyric, and one group used the software Tiki Taki to create a historical timeline that would help readers better understand the acts of racial violence depicted in the text. Another group drew inspiration from Citizen and used WordPress to create their own poetry collection called Citizen, an Urban Collegiate Lyric, containing original poetry based on their experiences at Queens College. On the final day of class, I presented students with a public digital gallery of their projects to visualize all that we had done together, to create a space for them to interact and engage with each other's projects, and also to have something that they could potentially share with their friends, family, or even future employers if they so chose. So as it may be obvious by now, my research on feminism and the material conditions in which language, ideas, art, and information circulate has translated into an interest in analyzing digital platforms. The assignments I've discussed teach students to interrogate the ethics, politics, and implications of the digital platforms that have come to structure so much of our daily lives, what I sometimes think of as platform literacy. In class, I incorporate free and open platforms like Haystack and WordPress because they allow us to be more critical participants in digital worlds. We have important conversations about website organization, data, privacy, navigation, user experience design, accessibility, the differences between proprietary and open source software, and the potential benefits and risks of learning and writing in public. Um, and as a side note, I've had to figure out a lot of this kind of alongside my students. And so I've been really grateful to the fantastic um, digital scholarship that's out there. I'm thinking specifically of work by um, Jade Davis and Jesse Stommel and Sean Michael Morris and Sophia Noble, as well as training institutes that are out there like Hilt and the Digital Pedagogy Lab, which I'd be happy to talk more about also in the Q&A. Um, and it also seems like here at Duke, you guys have a really strong community through the um, Franklin Humanities Institute and also the really exciting Triangle Network that is being built. For, for doing this kind, of, um, this kind of work. So to conclude, I've come to embrace public digital projects because I'm committed to critical, engaged, student-centered learning that prepares students for the world beyond the classroom. For me, this involves teaching students to better understand how language is a source of power that can reproduce and challenge conditions of inequality while also preparing them for a rewarding career um, and June Jordan has this great phrase for it. She calls it, um, the goal of her classes is to help students gain a reasonable degree of self-respecting self-sufficiency, which I've always really loved. Now, more than ever, I think we should be asking the kinds of questions that Bambara's and Jordan's pedagogies bring forth. How can our classrooms be most useful, both to the students who show up and to those beyond their walls who don't have access to the same resources and privileges, however relative or modest? What can we do in this space, in the short time that we have together to make a difference? And so I'll leave you with June Jordan's question. How will the American University teach otherwise? Thank you. Happy to take questions, open it up for more general conversation. Um, I've been really lucky so that the classes that I've always done these assignments in I don't think I've ever taught a class of more than like 28 students. And so um, especially breaking them down into small groups and um, that creates an opportunity to do some um, project management learning and, and collaboration. We talk very explicitly um, in the small group projects about the fact that I always tell them that I, I hated group work as a, as a student because I always found myself doing all the work. And so together uh, in our groups, we develop strategies for how to collaborate effectively. Um, and I think that's that kind of makes a, a little bit more manageable. And actually, at the end of the semester, you end up with fewer projects to grade than if every single student had written a research paper. And also because they're collaborating, I find that the, the quality of the project increases as well. So um, it's, it's worked pretty well. But I would be interested to hear um, how other people might do it in, in an even bigger class. 
Um, you had said at the beginning um, connections between the pedagogical changes at undergrad level and how that might impact the graduate level. Could you or say more? Well. Yeah, or vice versa? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to say more about that. Yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, I was just thinking about, you know, some of the changes that are happening, the conversations at the panel earlier today about, like, well, what should constitute a dis dissertation, right? What is the aim? What is the end that that, what is that supposed to do in the world? Kind of in the way that people are rethinking like the traditional seminar paper, like what is the, what could it be? What is the end that it's intended to serve? Um, and I think, you know, the more that there is uh, exposure at the graduate level through things like the Wired Lab and, and all the, the exciting things that are happening, I think it will start to infiltrate and, and trickle down. Um, but at the same time, I wonder if it's it's more reciprocal than that, right? Not necessarily such a top down. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious what you all think. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I, I really love and think inspired the connection you make between the, the female feminist scholars and, and today's DH, I think that's excellent. Um, I'm wondering how you came to those four mm -hmm. and why someone like Bell Hooks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and actually in my graduate seminar, we just read Teaching to Transgress last week. Which is yeah. brilliant. Yeah, and it's, and it's definitely part of the framing for the project. Um, honestly, the reason that I came to these four is simply because they were all teaching at CUNY in the late 1960s and 70s in this like super exciting, vibrant, pedagogical milieu in which um, people were experimenting and they were collaborating and there was this creative ethos and it was kind of before like the the standardized testing had so much in, encroached upon um, the experience of education and so I initially was drawn to these figures because of that connection and as I went to the archives um, some of which are at Spelman College some of which are at um, uh, Radcliffe I became really interested in the things that they were doing far after they left CUNY and went to other places, right? And they went to um, Stanford and they went um, to Duke even. Um, and so what I'm trying to do in the, in the book version of the project, which is really um, part one of this project, is really to think about like what was the significance of that kind of um, atmosphere of pedagogical innovation, what did that make possible, but also what were like the long-term effects of that, and how were these four figures continually reinventing the humanities and reinventing humanities pedagogy for the different politics um, of the moment, and also the different students they encountered, and the different institutions, and the different geographies, and the different um, place and time and context. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It does. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, can you say more about how you deal with students who don't want their work public? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. I haven't had that many examples, so um, if I can easily find the one blog that I showed from Haystack, mm, this one, you'll see there's not a name there. It's ccej.f16. Um, so often they will use some kind of uh, pseudonym um, and I'm lucky that I have connections with the Haystack Network, and so uh, that makes that a little bit easier. But in general, uh, if a student had a, have a solid reason for not wanting to publish and wanted to submit um, just to me, I would be completely fine with that. I think we really have to, part of student-centered pedagogy is listening to students, even when it's like counter to, to what you think and what you want and what you have a sense that might be good for them. And so if if they really don't wanna publish, part of what I see my job is trying to convince them that they have something to gain by this kind of public writing. And most of them do feel it and sense it and they get it. But I also work really hard to like share some of the research and the studies and help them to think about like why they might want a piece of writing out on the internet that they've worked really, really hard on that they've revised to death and um, what, what benefits that might bring them. Yeah. And maybe as a follow-up to that, because I had a similar kind of question, some of my most marginalized students don't actually want to be uh, pu uh, public even in the classroom with mm -hmm. some of the things that they want to say. Um, and so one thing that I've been working on more is, is sort of um, anonymous zines and that kind of thing. But mm, cool. I didn't know if you had any other things that you've done with students who who don't want um, even something as public as this with a, a different name on it? Yeah, um, I have a roundabout way of answering that, which is that um, one of the exercises that I do 
every semester is to have students co-author a set of community guidelines. Um, and we do that in order to try and make the classroom an inclusive space for every voice so that every student's voice um, is heard. I do activities almost every class like Think, Pair, Share. So students um, are talking to the person sitting next to them so that even if I haven't gotten to hear from every single student, they know at least one other person has heard what they want to say. Um, I should also mention that's a, that reminds me that, so these, these are the final projects, but there's a lot of kind of scaffolding that goes into it. One of the assignments is um, they, students write for every single class, uh, two students are the bloggers. And so they write a blog on the reading, everyone else comments, and then they come into class and they lead um, an activity or facilitation. So they have experience, yeah. So they have experience um, speaking in front of the class, they get to know each other really well. Um, and then we add on the community guidelines exercise to really um, have students express like what what will create an inclusive, an environment in which they do feel supported. Um, and I feel like, I was talking to somebody about this just yesterday, um, and sometimes it's it's the process as much as it is the final product, the act of intentionally trying to create a space and getting a voice and getting to shape their learning environment, um, I think can be just as important as the, the final thing that they come up with. I'm a women's and gender studies librarian at UNC, oh. and so I was just wondering about the library. Um, have you worked with the librarians at all? And if not, can you think of ways that libraries support can support this Oh my God, I have so many, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> So I'm at a new institution now. Um, I came from a very robust digital humanities institution to an institution where digital humanities is brand new. There's not any infrastructure uh, in, in place. I tried really, really hard to get my um, to get WordPress.org sites hosted uh, at my like on my university servers. Couldn't do it. Just kept hitting wall after wall after wall. And so eventually pulled them onto Reclaim Hosting, at least for now, until I'm able to meet with the library and have the kinds of conversations. And so this came up in the panel earlier today. Um, where did Elizabeth go? She was talking about how going, starting a new job and um, like being expected to do a lot of the things that I took for granted when I was at an R1 school that had so much support for digital pedagogy. And now I'm like, oh, I'm the digital pedagogy librarian and the professor and like all those things. Um, and so I think there's so much that uh, uh, librarians can do. Um, we had this this platform that I loved so much when I was at Queens College. Um, it was called Q Writing, and it was just, I think it was, it was an installation of commons in a box, which for me has been like the most um, pedagogically transformative tool. And so I think one of my goals um, for the new institution is to get something like commons in a box up and running so students can build websites and be in conversation and we can have different um, educational spaces and start thinking, because right now it's like very much um, a Blackboard school. Um, and so I just, I. And if we had something like a digital humanities librarian, someone who was really um, great at the different technologies and could come in and do workshops with students, like I, that is my dream is to have a digital humanities librarian that I could collaborate with. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. I'm just curious also talking about the, the question of um, librarianship and how that can play a role in mm -hmm. your teaching. Um, have you tried to, um, is there an institutional repository at your institution where you've looked into storing student projects where it might be relevant? I guarantee you there's not at my current one. Um, there probably was at my previous one. Yeah, <laughs> but that sounds like a great thing to have. So one more question, unless um, there are any others. Um, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, since there's not a lot of questions, I'm going to ask something that is kind of maybe open-ended or rambling, but it's something that I've been struggling with. You talked mm -hmm. about change mm -hmm. at the beginning, and you talked about the 60s. Um, you're a young professional, you're a young professor, so you have your whole career ahead of you. So I'm gonna ask something difficult. Oh, no. or at least it's difficult for me. Okay. Um, my parents uh, were in the legendary 60s at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up uh, shortly after that. Uh, and uh, I wanna say this, that um, talking about change, has anything really changed? And I'm talking about yeah. the, all the protests, mm -hmm. Uh, actual, you know, out in the street fighting and all that kind of thing. 
did anybody change anybody? And I really struggle with mm -hmm. this because I now we see that maybe, in fact, the other side got, became more entrenched. Yeah. Okay. Uh, has anything really changed? And how, how do you change someone else? Is it even possible to change oneself? So anyway, more on topic, uh, dealing with digital humanities and writing for the public. Uh, my main question would be, and we get this so much at Duke, uh, you're not the only one I'm picking on, uh, it, preaching to the choir, okay? You've heard that term, right? Yes. So uh, it happens so much, and it especially happens in the humanities. The people you're talking to agree with you. They don't need to hear you. And I bet that the people who read your students' <coughs> blogs and, and things, they probably don't need to hear it. I want to go that far to say mm -hmm. that. Yeah. To that extent. But uh, So how do you get to the ones that, who really need to hear that uh, if you really want to change someone? Mm -hmm. Not to diminish what you're doing because, yeah, if I were a student today, I sure would love to have someone else besides the professor read my work. Yeah. That, that is very definitely an improvement in my view. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about changing the, the, you know, maybe the whole university structure needs to be changed. I, I personally think maybe that's the case mm -hmm. uh, with the price of tuition, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, online, I don't know. I never liked online, even though I have a background in that. But uh, I wish there could be more real, <coughs> real interactions. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, I'm advocating for a free speech forum. And I mean everybody. Mm. Safe. Mm -hmm. At Duke. I, I want to support that. I want to donate to that if somebody will do it. Mm. Uh, I think the real interactions or uh, in our own families, everyone has someone who voted for the other side, right? Yeah. Start in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, I just would love to hear your reflections on this. You probably have a lot more recent information than I do, and just like to know what you, what you think about that. How, how can you address those, yeah, if, definitely. If, if at all possible? Sorry for the rambling. <laughs> those are great questions. Um, the first one, well, have, have I changed? Has anything changed? That you sound like my dissertation advisor, who was always pushing me to to grapple with the fact that like the neoliberalization of academia has intensified despite these progressive pedagogies of the 60s and 70s. So what do you do with that? Does it mean that they failed? Is it up to uh, us to keep them going? That is a question that keeps me up at night. Um, and so the other thing I was going to say is that. So you talked about the students writing. Perhaps it's preaching to the choir, and I agree with you to an extent. But I think part of the people who are it's changing are the students who do the writing, especially in the schools that I've taught at. I think um, they they are as much the the audience or the person that I'm aiming to influence through this kind of pedagogy. Um, one thing that I've always loved about teaching and the classroom is that at least in theory, everyone walks in with the goal of changing your mind and leaving the classroom thinking something differently than when you first walked in. And so that's a very bell hooks idea that the classroom is this site of ra radical possibility, right? And so I think there still is, especially at a school, at all the schools I've taught at, right? You get students from every walk of life. Um, there, I have not taught at, at elite and expensive institutions. And so you get so many different students and, um, I think a lot of them learn things, and I think their minds are changed about um, issues that they might not have all, all mo none of these students like signed up for this course. They didn't know that it was gonna be about education. And I think, at least I hope, through immersing them in debates and trying them to get to see how relevant these discussions are to their lives, I think they came to care about them and also to care about um, questions of inequality, because that is the goal of all of my courses, right? And so, um, but, but you also bring up a great point that that I also think a lot about and I don't have an answer to is just who is the audience for student writing, right? How do we, and that has to do with the, that's a pedagogical question, right? How do we create the conditions to uh, help students create writing or digital projects, whatever it is, that, that are actually gonna do important work in the world that people are gonna wanna engage with and read? That's hard, right? And so I often wonder, so sometimes it's a little bit more, not performative, but um, aspirational or like putting this writing out there in the world. It's an unpredictable thing. You don't necessarily know who's going to be the recipient. You don't know what's going to do. And that's even true for, you know, us as scholars when we put our writing out there. We we don't know who's going to read it and, and, and what work that will end up doing. And so I do think there is um, 
in thinking about models of social change, there has to we have to account for that unpredictable, unknowable, and it's, there's something almost optimistic about that, I think. Or pessimistic, I don't know. Cool. I think that was a, a great way to wrap up the session. Please, um, please join me in thanking Danica. Thank and you.